mistake, but live happens. Welcome to Camo Classroom. I'm your host, Eden from Camo, and today's show topic is how to look great in remote meetings. We're also gonna talk about what equipment essentials you need, various visual factors to consider, and share tips and best practices that we've learned through experience and by doing our own research. I'm joined today by Lorraine Lee, Janaid Ahmed, and Alec Johnson. Everyone, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Before we jump in, I'm going to ask for a one sentence introduction from each of you. Ladies first, we'll go Lorraine, Janaid, and then Alec. Ooh, I like that. Ladies first. Okay. <laughs> Well, hi everyone, my name is Lorraine. I am a virtual speaker, a consultant, and a LinkedIn learning instructor. And I am very passionate about helping individuals like you and organizations stand out and supercharge their professional presence. Janaid, you're up next. Rookie mistake, mute button on, right? Uh, my name is Janaid, rhymes with Lemonade. I'm a home studio architect over at Home Studio Mastery, and I've been helping folks, entrepreneurs, podcast hosts look good and sound good on camera. And my background comes from user experience design, so I love to bring that experience to the screen as well. Thank you. Hey, I'm Alec from uh, Take One Tech. So uh, Take One Tech is my uh, YouTube channel where I cover uh, all things tech, but specifically how to uh, look good on uh, on camera using things like uh, Camo, Ecamm Live, and uh, all those kind of things. So uh, with the Take One Tech Academy, I help people level up their online presence. And as you can see from everyone's video setup and their self introductions, you're at the right place if you want to learn how to stand out in your next big meeting. So. We're gonna start with a little rapid fire question and it's okay if you guys have the same answer, but it's also okay if you have different ones. I'm curious if you could only recommend one thing for someone to upgrade for showing up better to remote meetings, what would it be? We'll go in the same order, Lorraine, Janaid, and then Alec. Three seconds to think. Okay, uh, well, one item. Okay, I would say a microphone because audio is extremely important and if people can't hear you, it doesn't matter how nice your video is. All right, Janaid. Once you've got the microphone that Lorraine mentioned, then you want to make sure that you have good lighting because if people can't see you, they're not going to see uh, who they're talking to and make sure that there's no lights behind you. That's a uh, double tipper. All right, and then Alec. Yeah, and if you've got those things, then one of the biggest things for me would be a teleprompter so that you can have that eye contact in Zoom so that when you're actually looking at somebody, you're looking at them and they're looking at you. Nice, clutch. Well, all of those answers, well, not teleprompter, I'm gonna be honest, but lighting and microphone were definitely on my list of things that people absolutely bare essentials that you need to look and sound great. So Lorraine, you mentioned having a mic. Like, can you tell us a little bit about why audio is so important in meetings? Yeah, well, I mean, audio is, I mean, we're on meetings because we're talking to each other, right? And so the microphones in our laptops, which is still, you know, what a lot of people use, they are not very good. And so they often, you know, cause things to come in and out. You can't hear them super clearly. And so audio is really going to be one of those key ways to connect. Um, I know there's a lot of different variations out there in terms of, you know, what type of microphone uh, is best. I have just a very simple one. It's just an external microphone that I got from Amazon, nothing too fancy. And it works great. So, uh, you know, I always like to recommend any kind of equipment you buy it doesn't have to break the bank uh, to make a good impression in meetings. Yeah, totally. Um, Alec, what do you use for your mic? Uh, so this is a Shure MV7. And uh, one of the reasons why I got this one was because it's uh, got both XLR, uh, so you can plug it into an external device, but also USB. Um, so I bought this initially because it enabled me to just plug it directly into my computer, um, but still have that upgradeability of just being able to use it with um, something else. And the thing about a microphone, by the way, is that so much technology moves really quickly that you're constantly looking for upgrades. But a microphone is something that actually can last years and years and years. Uh, so it's definitely a worthwhile investment. Yeah. Janaid, what about you? What do you use and what do you recommend? I also recommend the MV7 because of its simplicity and its focus on what it was created for. So it was introduced very recently as a podcast microphone. Having that dual interface really speeds up the little things that you need to get it going. And it sounds beautiful, sounds great. And 
there's a lot of people using it already. And like Alex said, it is a great investment that's going to last for you, last, you know, last with you for a very long time. I totally agree. Um, I when I started podcasting, I was using one of those uh, snowball mics that it was like a circle, um, a sphere. And mm -hmm. I used it for five years before I upgraded. And the only reason I actually had to upgrade was because I didn't treat it very well. I, you know, <laughs> carried it around in my bag, cord was tossed left and right. And, you know, I was like, it's a circle. It's fine. It'll be fine in my travel bag. Um, it did break down eventually, but it lasted. If I took better care of it, I'd probably still be using it today. I'm using a Shure mic also. Um, I'm using one that does need an XL our adapter to be able to plug into your computer via USB. Um, but I love, I also always recommend that Shure MV7 because you know, you're able to plug it directly in and it's like super user friendly. Um, Lorraine, I love what you said about like tech not needing to break the bank. Do you have any other like really good Amazon buys that you use for your meetings? Um, I have a Logitech camera, so I think that has worked very well for me. I know, again, like you can go very high tech and very expensive with like fancy cameras and all that, but really the Logitech and the microphone have served me very well. Uh, one thing I would add for the microphone, uh, some software you might want to consider. There's a program called Crisp, K-R-I-S-P. And so even if your microphone is so-so, Crisp is a software you can buy that helps with noise cancellation, uh, anything that's not your voice. So that might be something else to consider if people are tight on a budget. That's a great tip. I actually also recently learned from a Camo power user about a software called Isotope, which I think does something very similar. It just like sort of gives you um, just better sound, even if your mic isn't the most expensive. And yeah, I just think that there's so many softwares out there now that can help the existing tech that we have be even better. And then, Janaid, you said lighting. I also have to absolutely agree about lighting. Can you tell us a little about, about what lighting you're using and what you recommend? So I recommend lighting that is uh, large LED panels with diffusion because when you add the diffusion on the lighting, it, it mimics natural lighting, um, especially when it's cloudy. I mean, that gives you the best possible light. Plus, it's easy on your eyes. It's easy on the eyes of uh, people watching you. And then it also enables that webcam to capture your likeness as opposed to it trying to work really hard to, uh, you know, capture your image. So having a good light and they could be, you know, starting from $100 to th the sky's the limit. Just start with something that's going to let you know the small loom cubes that that uh, the industry is recommending and pushing are really good for a clutch moment. But if you're going to be in this space for a longer time, I would recommend to get a larger light that can permanently stay there. Lorraine, you mentioned that you're using just a regular Logitech camera, but your mm -hmm. video looks super crisp and you're very well lit. And I think that lighting has to take a little bit of credit here because yeah. you know, no matter how great your camera is if you don't have lighting then people still can't see you so what kind of lighting are you using yeah that is a very good call out the lighting definitely helps and i think the logitech is good at picking up the lighting so i actually have a photo softbox right in front of me and then i have two ring lights on the side and uh, the one thing i really like about my uh, photo softbox is that there are multiple color gradient. So you have my, oh, cool. you see my remote here, there's warm, white and cold. So depending on time of day and maybe my makeup and things like that, it just gives you a little bit more optionality in terms of how you'll appear best on camera. Um, but I've heard, you know, what Janaid said too, like LED lights, I have yet to try them, but I've heard very good things about them. Alec, what about you? What can you give us on lighting? So I'm using uh, Nun lights and uh, they're um, Hand lights, LED lights, nice. but not rather than a panel light, they've got sort of big soft boxes on them. So uh, um, yeah, something uh, like this again, a large Ooh. light source though on uh, either side. So one in the front, and one at the uh, the side. Wow, that 
<laughs> that is my dream light setup, I think. Um, I, I have to level mine up a little bit. I'm actually using one of those little cube LED light thingies that Janaid mentioned. I actually got it at a video conference. It was by Aperture. They were handing them out. And um, honestly, I ha live in Brooklyn and my apartment is tiny. The light does not have to travel very far to hit my face. So um, it works for me, but I am always looking for ways to upgrade and I think I've just seen what I need to eventually level up to at some t some point. <laughs> it is it's true what you said though about the. Oh, go sorry, ahead. go on, Ryan. I was gonna ask, uh, do you get very hot with the lights? Because I I've, I've never seen a light set up with Great so question. I get heated from just this yeah. little one. So they they're really cool actually. They they they're not hot at all, so they don't get hot like uh, regular light bulbs. And the actual light fitting itself is quite far back as well. But no, it's, it's there's no no heat whatsoever. And uh, they're Nanlite 60s, uh, 4s or 60s, um, and they're running at about, say, 30% uh, of their, their capacity. So you don't actually need to use them at full, at full, yeah. full power. But they can really just enhance any, not these lights in particular, but any lights is going to enhance any camera, like you say. So even a poor quality camera, but with good lighting, uh, it's amazing what you can uh, get out of it. Mm -hmm. So just on that note, Lorraine, that you mentioned, um, I find that even with my little little lights going on, maybe I just get hot very easily, but I always feel like I am getting more oily by the second with when the lights are shining on me. And I'm just gonna use this as a moment to talk about like makeup and anti-shine powder. Does anyone else here use anything to mitigate shine? Cause I put on anti-shine powder right before the show started and I feel like I'm already progressively getting shinier. I use a little some I put something on today. Um, I'm already forgetting what the brand name was, but it's quite a popular one. It's like a little bit more like liquid foundation um, oh, okay. consistency. And so just a little bit here. But yeah, I'm with you. I get very hot under the lights and just being on camera. I think I get hot easily as well. What about you guys? Either of y'all have any shine issues or or just me and Lorraine? <laughs> Uh, I've got an all over shine really going on, but uh, I've got an air conditioning unit just up there. So uh, that helps. <laughs> nice. Yeah, I'm the same way. I do get a little bit of shiny forehead all, uh, you know, throughout the day. So I'll walk out, wash my face, clean it off and come back in. You know, that that always helps. That's a nice little tip. Um, that doesn't always work if I already have my makeup on. So that's why I go yeah. with like the just the additional shine powder um, to sort of help absorb the oil a little bit. But for the guys out there that don't have to deal with makeup, Janaid's got that tip for you guys. And the other thing that you can also do is, again, adding more diffusion to the light will also help with the shininess. Mm -hmm. Like you can tell Alec ha might have a shiny skin, but because he has diffused light fall falling on him, he's not as shiny. That is a good point. And I actually have thought about that, about maybe putting um, one of those like translucent sock things over the light to maybe just mm -hmm. make it a little softer. Um, but that's a tip that I'm going to take away from this meeting and try out for the next one. All right. Now, Alec, you brought up teleprompters. Um, I use whenever I'm doing teleprompter setup, I use just a very basic setup. I actually just set up a personal phone underneath my camera. What kind of teleprompter setup do you use? Because I feel like it's probably a lot more robust than mine. Yes, yeah, so I've gone through a couple actually. So um, the first one was a uh, using a little Lilliput uh, A7 field monitor. So using an, it's it's basically a monitor for a you know for a camera, um, but you can plug it into your computer and then uh, it just shows up as another monitor. Um, and that was with a, a Desview T3 teleprompter, which is about sort of this big. Um, so it's actually fine for just if you're on Zoom calls and you want to just have that eye contact with people. Uh, and we, uh, we talk about teleprompters. It's not for reading scripts, although that's what they're technically originally intended for. It's so that you can basically see your other Zoom participants in a screen that you're looking through to see your uh, your camera or looking into the camera through. Um, so I had that one for a long time and that worked uh, great. But when you start doing bigger meetings or want to have more things on the screen that you're looking at, um, then uh, yeah, having a bit more screen real estate works uh, well. So uh, I've got now a 12 and a half inch uh, 
again, Lily put field monitor. And by the way, the reason to use a field monitor rather than something like an iPad or an iPhone, if you want to actually do some other work on it, um, is that the, um, the the screen's not back to front because you can flip the screen in the, with the Lilliput field monitors, whereas with a with an iPad, you'll find that it's backwards, so it can get a little bit weird sort of <laughs> moving the mouse around when it's going in mm. the opposite direction to the way you're expecting. Yeah, Janaid, it sounds like you have some knowledge and know-how about teleprompters too. What about what about you? What do you recommend? Yeah, so I, I use something similar. So I have the Lilliput 10-inch with a 12-inch uh, teleprompter setup, and and the teleprompters, like Alec mentioned, it's for reading text, but we're using it as a confidence monitor or a meeting monitor. So you're uh, kind of like telestrating a a thing that's happening, and you know also having that eye contact built in. So I've been using one, and I've been recommending it for my clients because it just makes it so much easier for them to make that human connection. Plus, when you have a a confidence monitor, so to say, every single meeting that you're recording, guess what? You can take out pieces because you've been looking directly at the camera. Nice. Lorraine, what about you? Have you experimented with teleprompters at all? Not not real not at all actually. And so, you know, hearing both Alec and Janae share their insights is super helpful. I, I would say, you know, the the one time I'm using some sort of scripting, um, you know, assistant is with uh, Prezi Video. So when I'm giving yeah. presentation, my presenter notes are at the top of the screen. And so that's me just manually scrolling through. Um, but that's how I, you know, maintain eye contact during meetings if I'm meeting to present. Um, but yeah, I'm curious to try some of the, the rest of everyone's suggestions. I think that would be very helpful to see, you know, other people's faces while you're talking instead of doing the eye contact thing, then looking down, checking, looking back up. Yeah, I love that you mentioned the the presenter notes for Prezi because I also use that for every single Prezi presentation that I did. Oh, I was like, yeah. I wondered, I was like, oh, am I the only person that uses notes? Is everyone just going, <laughs> you know, they don't need the script or anything. But I was like, I feel like this is such a clutch feature to have is is to be able yeah. to have notes there. And, yeah, and just agreed. on sort of a similar um, note, this is something that people might not know about Camo, but Camo doesn't do teleprompting, but you are able to set your Camo window transparency to like 50% or 25% and have notes behind you on just in a Word doc or something. And so you can still see yourself as you are talking, but you can also see notes behind you. So it's not, it's not gonna replace a teleprompter, but it is a nice little hack that I don't think very many people know about. I didn't know that, that's a cool feature. Yeah, really so yeah, cool. I got to go into the, the actual advanced settings and window transparency, mm -hmm. and it's there. So for a cool. quick little video, sometimes you don't want to get the full setup out, just go 50% on that camo window transparency. All right, and speaking of camo, that would have been my answer if I could only recommend one thing for someone to showing up better for remote meetings. Um, I love what Lorraine said about audio because there actually have been a lot of studies done about how if people can't hear you clearly, they perceive you as less credible um, and people are a lot quicker to tune out if they can't hear you. But this is sort of translatable to video too. When you people are able to see you very clearly on video and your video looks good, our brains perceive that as being more credible. Like first impressions are important. Um, and now that we've talked about the equipment essentials and everyone is ready to look great on video, we have our audio, we have our lighting, we have our camo, we have our teleprompter set up. Let's talk a little bit about visual elements that people, I don't want to necessarily say overlook, but maybe just haven't thought about. Um, so we'll go around the room on this one too. Let's start with Janae this time as the home studio mastery king. What are some of the most common mistakes that you see people make with their office scene setups? And that's an excellent question. Paying attention to what's in your background. A lot, a lot of the times when we're setting up our offices, guess what we're seeing? We're only seeing what we see on our desk. You know, our desk looks beautiful. Everything is set up really nicely. But when we, for, we forget to look through the camera lens, and that's everything behind us because I, when it's some when things are behind you, you, you're not paying attention to it. So making sure that you're paying attention to both aspects of things. Now, what I see here is very messy. I wonder if I could switch the camera to show you my, my messy desk setup. But 
what uh, what you see is a very nicely curated backdrop with with uh, things that I love, colors and whatnot to show, showcase my branding. So think of all the things that people see in the camera and it's going to take a little bit, but guess what? If you start paying attention to it, you can start curating that background, being that interior designer that you are to create your own personality in that shot. I love that because I was actually just commenting on Lorraine's backdrop when we were backstage before the show. And I was saying that everything in her background scene feels very intentionally placed. And so Lorraine, can you give us a little bit about how you decided on your backdrop? <laughs> Yeah, well, I feel like I, you know, every few months I iterate and add like a new drawer or something. But essentially, yeah, I mean, it is very curated. Um, I have some plants here. I feel like plants just make Love you seem more it. personable and just, you know, there. I think there are studies that have shown that being around plants makes you happier and just you have better well-being overall. Um, this is kind of a new thing I added recently. Get out of the way. Uh, Muay Thai gloves that I retired. So, you know, having like nice little personal touches in the background like that, where people are like, oh, what is that? And it gives them a chance to ask something about you and learn about you. I feel like that goes a long way in developing those relationships and meetings, um, especially when we're so used to just always like getting into the, the small talk. How are you? You know, I'm good. How are you? I'm good too. And then that's kind of where it ends. So I think the background is a really important way to help people get to know you and just kind of build those relationships and meetings. Yeah, totally. Um, and I can't, I mean, Alec, look at your background. How did you, <laughs> what was this? Can you give us sort of how you settled on yours? Because it is just, it is, I am just, you know, the raised hands emoji right now. <laughs> Um, it's been a bit of a, an evolution, I guess, as well. But this is just uh, really as well being that sort of functional. So having like acoustic panels on the wall to help with the uh, the sound and things like that. And uh, I would say that this is definitely more my kind of streamer setup uh, for live streaming and, and content creation. Uh, whereas typically in a Zoom meeting, I might change this to a more uh, neutral uh, color. So the walls are just painted gray so that they're a neutral gray and I can put any color of light on the back of them. So I've got two lights there that are nice. adding that sort of light behind me. Uh, so I can sort of change it out to make it maybe something a little bit more neutral or professional, depending on the <laughs> the, the thing that I'm doing. So uh, one thing I'll say, though, about uh, about backgrounds is if you haven't got, you know, the, the space necessarily, I know lots of people are working from home. Uh, and so there was a big rise in the number of people using virtual backgrounds. Um, and I would just say to use those uh, with caution, <laughs> because um, I would see a lot of people with, you know, video backgrounds, that kind of stuff. And uh, just as you know, the others have said already, you know, being intentional about what's there. Uh, the same goes for virtual backgrounds as well. Um, and uh, make sure that you haven't got anything that's going to be overly distracting. If you are using the um, the virtual backgrounds and green screen, um, then having good lighting will help to separate you from whatever is really in the background. Um, if you can get a green screen, that is going to just make it so much better as well. I've been in so many Zoom calls where. People have been, you know, using the virtual background uh, thing in Zoom, and then you'll just see like a ghostly figure appear, like a <laughs> almost a, and a disembodied head just moving in the background because it's it's trying to figure out like who's, uh, you know, who's supposed to be in shot. So uh, if you are going to use virtual backgrounds, having an actual green screen can just make that work so much better too. I love that I add, you brought that up. Yeah, go ahead, Lorraine. Yeah, I would add. I mean, that's a great point about the virtual backgrounds too. Like one other thing I like to say is to try when you can to default to your real physical background just because like mm -hmm. alex said like the head is disappearing or, or or appearing the hand is you know off the screen and on video we're already working very hard to you know read people's facial expressions and to just pay extra attention right because video is a little bit more work than in person it's a little bit less natural and so when you add the virtual background it just adds this whole other strain on the human mind to just be like what is happening right now in front of me so mm -hmm. as you know, best as you can try to have the physical background and you know when other point I would make is that sometimes people I think get overwhelmed with the background because they think the whole house has to be perfect no it's just this space behind you everything else can be messy that no one sees and so try to keep that in mind when you know approaching how, how you curate it a hundred percent I actually uh, I joke that the pan and zoom tool seems like something that is very very basic but if my video was at 100% right now, you would see all of this mess on my desk behind me. Um, 
there's definitely a couple of dirty napkins left over from lunch. And so I love that, not to be a shameless plug, but sometimes if you just hit a little pan and zoom and crop out some of the distractions, it can bring you much more into focus. Um, and I also wanna say, there was a Harvard Business Review study that was done, I think in 2021, sort of after the pandemic had been going on for a while, about how virtual backgrounds were super popular for a hot second, but over time, people got tired of them and it became sort of like a, a bit and people don't take you as seriously when you show up on, on virtual backgrounds was the sort of TLDR on that. So. Um, before we move on, Janae, did you have any thoughts on virtual backgrounds that you might yeah, want to Yeah, so share? the virtual backgrounds were really important, especially for students going to school, right? So for them, they don't want to show off, hey, because we don't know a lot of students having the, you know, where they're living, what kind of condition they are. So this it was a really great savior for students going to school, uh, especially elementary school, middle school and whatnot. But for professionals, I, I think it's definitely something that they need to, you know, um, chalk it off because you've been spending well, how many years now in front of a camera and you haven't spent some time to clean up that mess in the background. I think it just goes to show uh, what's important in their lives. And it, the question then comes down to, do you, do you really want to work with a person who's trying to hide something in their background? Yeah, and I love um, from Chris Stone, shout out to the Dealcasters legend yeah. out here. Um, yeah, virtual backgrounds, they, they can be distracting and people want to see the real authentic you. And just as we've been talking about, if, if you just put a little bit of intentional thought into what's behind you, um, it can, it doesn't have to be cluttered or distracting. It can actually also be like conversation starters. like. Yeah. I, you know, I love Lorraine's plants. Like, I don't recognize what those flowers are, but some people maybe would recognize those flowers and it could be used as an icebreaker. So I, I like the idea of being very intentional about what's in your background shot and just like definitely don't overlook it um, because it's part of the first impression that, that people see also, so. Um, Lorraine, I know that you do coaching for people sort of one on one for for having being better at presenting and and doing better video. What about you? Do you have any major mistakes that you feel like people often see with their like background? Um, not with their background. I would say the biggest mistakes I see are around probably framing is a big one. Well, eye contact, but oh, we, we yeah. talked about eye contact, but framing is a big one. And so we're all framed very nicely in our videos. You know, we have a little bit of space above our head. We're taking up, you know, as much of the, the video screen as we can. And then we're all showing a little bit of our torsos and so our hands can get on screen. And so what I see a lot of is like big face or, down below, up above. So um, those aren't the ideal. And like you said, first impressions are everything. And so, you know, subconsciously or not, people do make that impression or do kind of interpret and, and judge you uh, based on how you appear on camera. And so, you know, make sure your framing is good to go. That's going to be a big piece because, of course, you know, that's that's the main thing they're seeing. I love that you brought up framing. Um... Alec, can you tell us a little bit about framing best practices? I know Loren kind of talked about what she sees a lot, but I know you are Mr. Take One Tech Academy. So <laughs> could you tell us about how you would recommend for people to be framed? Yeah, so there's a, um, a great guy, Chris Fenwick, um, who is not so much in uh, uh, our streaming communities, but is in the Office Hours, so Alex Lindsay's Office Hours community. And he created something called the uh, Fenwick Overlay, uh, which basically mm -hmm. uh, shows you where you should place your yourself. So your eyes should be about on the cool. uh, top third down from the top, and then have your head sort of framed in that top sort of two thirds, and anything sort of thereabouts is going to help. Um, so yeah, it's a great little overlay and a little cheat there. So, But having your eyes on, a lot of people would seem to naturally think that their eyes should be centered. Uh, but what that does is if your eyes are down here, it makes you look like you're, you're, you're too short. So having them in the top third is, the, is the, the secret there. Nice, yeah. I'll have to steal that template from you and, and share it. Maybe just get it added as a default one into camo. Um, 
Yeah, yeah we have a yeah. we have a question from our friend Crystal and Lorraine. Are your plants real? Good question. So this is the orchids are real. That was a recent gift. So these are actually dried plants. So yes, they're real, but they're dried. So I'm not going to kill them. <laughs> so that's a nice little hack for any people who don't have a green thumb out there. <laughs> nice. Do you know? Do you know? There's also Lego recently came out with some uh, plants that you can build these sets. Oh, so yeah. I got one for my my wife. She's got an orchid plant because you know how long the life of an orchid is. I mean, no reason they're they're fresh, right? Um, so that's another addition people can have. Yo, and those would show up great on camera too, because they're a little, I think, bigger than than what they usually are. So nice. I, I love that. Um, just one more little thing about virtual backgrounds is I do want to mention that they can be used strategically. Um, I was actually just on a call with a camo power user. Shout out to Richard Zolter, master of Zoom. Um, he, his thing is standing out on Zoom calls. And he told me a story about how he was attending a virtual session with an author. And he had set up a virtual background with all the book covers that the author had published. And he didn't even, you know, say anything on the call, but it was noticed by the author and the team reached out via DM to be like, hey, the author loves your background. So people notice how you show up to calls. And if you're going to be using virtual backgrounds, let's just make sure they're a little um, intentional. All right. Um, Lorraine, I actually had this one question for you. Um, nothing against the guys, but women have historically been a lot more scrutinized for what we wear, especially in working situations. Um, yeah. Is what you wear to remote meetings something that people should still be thinking about in 2023? Yes and no. Um, I'm pretty casual on <laughs> meetings now. <laughs> I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. Um, I used when we started off going remote, I still tried to be very buttoned up. It was also like a newish job for me. Uh, so I did pay attention to what I wore. And then over time, started wearing more casual clothes, sometimes t-shirts, stopped wearing makeup all the time. And so I think that was just a, a natural shift or maybe I just felt more comfortable myself just you know, people showing up on video as their most genuine selves and feeling more comfortable in their own skin. And like you said, like yeah. women, you know, when we go to the office, it's what we wear is generally more uncomfortable and you wear so heels and all that. Yeah. So yeah, just being able to, I think, to lean into just showing your true self um, has has made a difference. And, and that's what I do. I, I see people though, who look more put together on calls and I definitely take notice and I'm like, oh, they look great. Um, but for me, I think it's a balance just between, you know, I'm not in t-shirts um, as much anymore, but still, you know, maybe this is like a little more casual, but there's a collar, for example. Um, and then I have makeup for this show, but normally I, maybe I wouldn't make, uh, wear as much makeup. Yeah, and I see Janaid and Alec both wearing their branded t-shirts. Love that, guys. <laughs> They look good, uh, collared shirts. <laughs> yeah, they do. Um, and yo, for the, some of, I see some people just joining us right now, just so y'all know, I'm doing a little, this is Camo Classroom. We're doing topic on how to look great in remote meetings. And we have guests Lorraine Lee, Janaid Ahmed, and Alec Johnson. So, all right, now that we have gone over scenes and dress codes, visual things to consider, let's get into some of the fun tech stuff. Alec, I'll go to you first on this because you are Mr. Take One Tech and you literally <laughs> teach people all the things about tech and how to show up great on meetings. What would be your recommended app flow if someone really wanted to stand out with like using lower thirds, overlays, or slides? Um, so yeah, you can obviously do those kind of things in uh, in Camo. So having those little overlays that you can turn on. So if you want the little bug in the bottom corner, for example, with your name and things like that, then that can all be done uh, within uh, Camo. Um, for presentations, uh, I use Keynote, but I don't do the whole sort of creating slides and then me just being in a little box over to one side. I think creating more of an immersive experience is the way to go there. And I do that with uh, Ecamm Live, uh, where I'm bringing in my, uh, my Keynote. Um, however, the Keynote note aspect of it is just taking up one portion of the screen because uh, I think that you know really it should be you delivering the message and the slides or the the information let's not call it slides but the information that you're putting up on the screen um, should be in support of that um, and so 
having it that you're still the kind of front and center and the information is coming on in support of that is going to be the, the way to do that. I also use um, an app called Video Pencil, uh, which allows me to sort of draw on the screen. Um, so mm -hmm. that means that, you know, if you've got any notes that you want to share during the, the meeting or any uh, any explanation that you need to give, um, then using that is, uh, is definitely the, a great little tool to use as well. Wow, that that's, you just like, I think that was too much information for me to process all at once. Um, I'm going to have to catch the replay on, on this. Um, but I yeah. Will, I will say one, Go I will ahead. Also say one other thing. For, we're talking about the, the sort of tech hardware. Um, one of the best things for Zoom meetings that I think is really overlooked is a Stream Deck. Um, so I bought the Stream Deck for live streaming. But to be able to control your entire meeting, your presentation, switching cameras, doing all of this sort of stuff from a Stream Deck, which is a device that's basically got a whole series of different buttons on the front of it. Uh, but having that as kind of like your mission control, where you're controlling everything, um, is, is a real sort of game changer. And they also make a pedal as well. So uh, I've effectively got uh, three Stream Decks on my desk and then two pedals. So that's like with three, three buttons on each decks. one. So being able to control all of the, uh, you know, the, the, the flow, it's actually really crucial because if you think about if you're in a face to face meeting, um, there's no real interruption in the flow. Usually, you know, you're just there delivering whatever content, whatever value it is, whether it's a pitch, whether it's educational, whatever. Um, so often in Zoom meetings, though, I find it's let down by people getting caught up with the tech, like they're going to go and share their screen and then they're clicking, which screen shall I share or not that one? How do I do this? And it all interrupts the flow. And so it's about having a completely seamless experience going from you being full screen to bringing in some slides to maybe showing a portion of your screen and being able to just switch between all of that seamlessly with the put touch of a button or the press of a foot pedal is, uh, is, a, is a real game changer in terms of delivering your real value to people. Yo, that is like probably the next step for me. And Aiden Fitzpatrick wants to know, could you guys give us a little, just like your top three hotkeys, both since I know y'all are both using Stream Decks or something similar. That, that's, that's a tough one, guys, because uh, there's just everything's on the Stream Deck as a button. So I don't have one particular hotkey. I mean, the mute one's always handy. <laughs> um, and I'll tell you one, though, it actually is a space bar. So touch for space bar to unmute in Zoom. Uh, that can be a handy one if you're just on mute, but you don't want to fiddle around trying to find the button. If you are just using a keyboard, uh, a lot of people don't realize just pressing the space bar will temporarily unmute you while you're pressing it. That's a, a handy little one to, to know, I guess. Junaid, what about you? I saw you switching some scenes over there. So what are yeah. what are your sort of go-to hotkeys or Stream Deck keys? <laughs> well, for on Stream Deck, I've like uh, Alex set up uh, the different scenes. I've done the same thing, especially when using with different software. Uh, it's great for that, uh, working with Zoom and, and other applications that are, you know, at the tip of your fingers, literally. But then to change cameras, I'm using something different called the A10 Mini Extreme. Uh, so I can go from one camera to another camera, which is turned off, of course. And then my rear camera where I can show different things I have in the background. Uh, the overhead cam, again, it's all programmed in here, so I can just go from one shot to another shot. The other thing that I love about it is that I can record uh, individual uh, videos as I'm recording, so then I can in post say, hey, I, want, I, want, I like this shot better than that shot. So it's really great for post editing, and that's personal preference why I've, I, I use it. Nice. Lorraine, what about you? Do you use any keyboard shortcuts while, while you're doing meetings or presentations or? Well, I definitely don't have those, whatever you both just shared. That was very <laughs> cool, but just my regular keyboard. Um, no shortcuts, but I, I will say maybe going back to the start of our conversation, uh, one of the benefits of the external mic is that they have a mute unmute button. And so that's just a really nice way to Alex's point. You just you don't like that that lag to drag your mouse over and click unmute is just very unnatural. And especially I'm, I'm an introvert, so especially for introverted personalities, that extra kind of few seconds to get over there is just a deterrent to help you speak up. So I like using my mute unmute button um, directly on the mic. Nice. I, I love that directly on the mic, but I also love the, the, the space bar press to press to talk. I, I feel like it, it has the very like old school sort of on air radio vibe where you, you have to like press to talk. I, I actually told one of my team members, I need him to help me set up my, I have a little, um, macro pad 
that can serve as sort of like a stream deck. I was like, I need to set up a push to talk button. Um, but I actually, I, I bought this, but I don't have it fully set up yet. I'm also have, that's an area of improvement and a way that I, I want to level up. Um, and all right, so going back to the original question, I'm just rolling it back a little bit because Lorraine has had some expertise back when she was at Prezi on, on doing slides and overlays and like lower thirds. Um, could you just tell, tell us a little bit about like some of like the best practices you feel people should be doing or like apps that can facilitate these? Yeah, definitely. So I worked at Prezi for three years and just a few months after I joined, we launched this product called Prezi Video and Prezi Video allows you to bring your content on screen with you. So um, Alec was saying before, you know, virtual really gives us this opportunity to create more of an experience for our viewers and we don't want us to be super small in the corner and you just lose that human connection on camera, it becomes much harder for people to pay attention to what you're saying. So Prezi allows me, now I'm still using it, um, allows me to bring my visuals on screen. Um, you can either pre-prepare pre something or you can add things on your screen in real time, depending on you know what your use case is. Maybe it's a more casual meeting or maybe I'm doing a virtual keynote, for example. So um, yeah, it's been a game changer. I mean, many people still haven't seen that. They're still very used to the screen shares. Many companies are still just sticking to the status quo and, and doing the screen share. And so to, to do something like even just a little bit different, just completely wows the audience and just makes them that much more engaged. Nice. Thank you. Um, all right. So also, I see some questions rolling in in the chat, just so everyone knows. Um, I have like 10 minutes saved at the end of the show, so we'll, we'll get to some of your questions. Um, I wanted to chat a little bit now that, you know, we've talked about apps and how people can use apps to level up their videos. Let's talk a bit about like in meeting best practices. So we talked about mute, unmute and eye contact. Is there anything that we haven't already covered throughout the, organically throughout the course of the conversation? Anything that anyone can think of that we want to add right now? I have one if no oh. one. Yeah, about doing meetings, like in meetings, what yeah. people can do. I can add one. So I meetings is a topic I'm very passionate about. I have two LinkedIn learning courses. Uh, I think if anyone wants to learn more. Um, but I think one big thing um, that people miss in meetings is the energy part of it. And I feel like, Eden, you're doing a really good job bringing the energy and excitement. But, you know, I, I referenced this earlier, the status quo, people join the meeting, you screen share, you're just kind of going through the motions. But really, I think meeting facilitators need to think of themselves as entertainers in a way and that they need to bring the energy, they need to set up the structure and just make it clear what's about to happen and get everyone involved. And so um, I would just call out uh, energy is, is a big thing to, to keep in mind on these calls. Oh, wow. Thank you. I totally didn't even think about that. But thank you for for saying that I'm doing a good job so far. But yeah, y'all bring the energy, like be engaging on video, like also be you. But like we are so sensory overload with all the things that are available at our fingertips to get distracted by. So you don't want people to, you know, if you are boring on a meeting, you will notice people's eyes dropping and them starting to scroll on their phones. So thank you for, for that tip, Lorraine. Um, do either of you guys have any other in-meeting best practices to add? So what I do if I'm doing like a QA and a or a workshop or something like that is I actually bring the like the person that's asking the question up onto the virtual stage so I can bring those into, uh, in my case, Ecamm Live. Um, and so if there's somebody asking a question, I'll still have myself on spotlight for everybody. But then the person asking the question is then sort of on the stage as well. And that makes it great for sort of repurposing that as well. So if you are recording the session, if it's a workshop, um, then it means you get to see that and you can have actually a really well produced thing. You could have something looking kind of like you've done here, um, but it's from the Zoom participants. And also the other participants, if you've got lots of people in the room as well, um, they are seeing everyone together on the stage rather than just the typical Zoom look. So trying to do something that yeah. is not just your average Zoom or Teams meeting, um, but has that more produced thing. And that's exactly to Lorraine's point as well about making it, you know, more in, you know, interesting and engaging and uh, yeah, less likely for people to uh, to turn off in that respect. <laughs> nice. Janaid, before we move on, do you have anything to add? Yeah, so 
ask questions that will lighten up and bring the entire energy of the people that are on the call to say, oh my God, I want to answer that question. Because something that I've noticed is when you ask simple questions, people are jumping right on to answer that question where they don't have to think too much and they have a preference. Uh, that's why when you're having a conversation or, or a Zoom meeting, bringing your personal team, like your favorite football team or your favorite basketball team always gets the people riled up and like, oh my God, that's my team, you know? Not, and then, you know, you kind of have a little banter going on. So that also raises the energy and brings that little connection back together into humanity. All right, and go Sixers. Joel and beat MVP, <laughs> baby. Um, <laughs> all right, so I'm trying to be a little bit conscious of time because I do want to answer a few of the audience questions. So by the way, audience, if you have any questions, drop them in right now. We'll be getting there very shortly. Um, I wanted to do a little hot topic talk to um, wrap before we go to Q&A, and that is AI. We cannot get through a single day without hearing about what ChatGPT or Chad, as Doc Rock would call, call him, <laughs> is up to or what Bard is up to these days. Do you guys use any AI tools for either meeting prep, in meeting, or post? Janaid, I want to go to you first because I know you have a few AI workshops and talks coming up. <laughs> Yes, so AI has been, it's almost like a tutor slash personal assistant because anything that you are going to do a Google search on, you can now ask questions and kind of get an idea of, hey, what? give me more on this topic. Or if you're trying to look at, at a book that you want to read, you're having a conversation with somebody and they've written a book, guess what? Good old AI already has access to that information so you can go in and uh, ask those questions and kind of get an idea of, hey, where should this conversation go? So it's been really powerful in using AI before a meeting. Lorraine, Alec, what about you guys? Do you all use AI as and part of your daily workflow for meetings or for any other things? Alec, you wanna go first or I can take it? You, you take it. Sure, sure. Well, I, I don't use it too much. What, what I use it for is um, if I need, usually actually with my LinkedIn learning courses, if I just want some prompts or ideas, you know, I'm, I'm filming a, a course on this topic. What are some, you know, key points that might fit within this? And I usually use it as a launching off point to and it gives me other ideas for other things. I, I think for meetings, um, I haven't used it yet, but where I imagine it would be helpful is in summarizing meetings. So someone takes notes or some sort of, you know, app takes notes for you. You can summarize it, make it more clear, and then it can help you write out an email to send out the email follow-up. It's important to make sure action items and deadlines and all of that is set up. Yeah, and by the way, y'all, I really have to shout out Lorraine's newsletters on LinkedIn and her LinkedIn Learning Nano courses. I have learned so much about like just she gives like the most actionable tips that you can bring to your meetings through her newsletter and in her LinkedIn Learning courses. Like she has tons of little gems that she teaches that are just nice. all super actionable. So just wanted to shout that out Thank before you. before we go we we before I pass over to Alec. Well, first of all, also subscribe to Lorraine's newsletter. Absolutely love it. So I've uh, got to second that uh, sentiment there as well. Um, in terms of AI, yeah, I'm using it all the time now, actually. And I created a, a, an ebook, so um, AI for course creators. Um, and it goes through basically the 12 steps of creating a course. Um, and it's, you know, so often I find that people struggle with creating a course where they uh, maybe have the knowledge, but they don't understand necessarily how to structure a course, how to promote a course and all of that. So the 12 steps takes you through from having an initial idea or a niche you're working in, but then all the way through to launching it, um, you know, email scripts for uh, your you know, sales process, um, lead magnets that you're going to use to build, bring people into your, uh, your email database and all of that kind of stuff. So uh, that's a guide that I've done. But when it comes to uh, chat GPT in particular, which is the one that I'm, I'm using heavily at the moment is, um, you can obviously put in prompts to ask questions or to, to get it to give you feedback. Um, but make sure that if you are doing things on a, in a particular thread, actually have you know one single prompt that you're, or one single uh, thread that you're using for all of those things because it's going to learn all of the conversation and so i have like virtual assistant gpt is one of my threads i've got various different ones for other things like uh, some events and uh, you know the take one tech academy a lot of the things that i've done in that have been through um uh 
the first point of that or the starting point has been a, a chat GPT prompt. Um, but then it's no replacement for a person. You've still got to actually then go in and refine it. So I've never really taken anything directly out of there and just used it directly. Um, however, uh, the starting point in terms of outlines and things like that uh, have all been done in there. And then it remembers all of that conversation. Uh, remember mm -hmm. is a bit of a weird word, but uh, it can reference all of that conversation. Um, and so rather than just going in with you know individual prompts, give me this or give me that, which it does really well, let it build on the, uh, the, the, the things that it's, you're, you're teaching it. That's an excellent point, Alec. And I've, <laughs> just like that, I've, I've built multiple conversations all on that one, one single topic. So then it learns and it, it can come back to you like, yeah, it's, it's, it's really powerful. And and ask it as well what it needs to know. So, um, you know, if you say I'm planning on doing this, you ask, ask me qu any questions that you need to know to be better informed to, to, to complete this task. And you'll be surprised yeah. by the questions that it comes back with. Wow, I just learned that I've been using chat GPT wrong this whole time. I'm over here, you know, just asking individual questions, opening up, closing it, new tab every time. And yeah, you guys, that's a great tip, it, and it and it makes sense. Um, I still have a ton to learn about AI, and I'm I'm just taking all of this in right now. I I do I don't use this myself, but I've seen a lot of people use um, Otter.ai for live transcription of meetings, which I'm not gonna lie, I've reaped the benefits of them using that tools because I, I they share the transcripts and I'm like yes someone else was using AI to transcribe this meeting so I don't have to but um I do know that like uh our friend Doc Rock uses otter.ai for for their live meeting transcriptions um so I can definitely recommend, recommend that one so take take that script once you get the meeting script out take that entire script however long it is and drop it into chat GPT and say summarize this meeting and then you'll get a really concise little paragraph for it that is amazing as well. And it'll tell you like the key points and everything. Nice. And what's really cool with the latest version of Otter AI, they actually switched from using their own technology because they've been around since 2009. They switched to their own, from their engine to using OpenAI's ChatGPT3 engine. Mm -hmm. And they've initially, they've actually recently added key takeaways. So it'll also oh, cool. also look at your conversation and give you these questions. Oh, these are the things that you talked about in this conversation. And so it's really awesome. And I've been using Otter for all my podcast transcriptions. And it's beautiful because I can then save the name of each conversation of each participant in the speaker. So as I'm recording new conversations with the same people, guess what? It knows who you talk to. So then you can search by speaker. Hey, give me a conversation around this uh, when I talk to Eden on my podcast. <laughs> oh my God. I need to echo what Brusco has said. Sorry if I'm pronouncing that wrong, but I just got pancakes laughed with, <laughs> with information <laughs> about AI. Um, yeah, I just think that AI is, is becoming part of our everyday lives. Everything is powered by AI now and like learning how to use it for your productivity and your workflow is is like super super important so all right so we are getting a little close on time and i promised the audience some q a so i have pulled a couple of questions that um from the audience and dennis van Espec I speak, sorry if I said that wrong, but what gear would you suggest for a newbie? And let's go with Alec first, Mr. Take One Tech. Uh, the iPhone that you've likely got in your pocket with camo. Nice. Janaid, what kind of gear are you recommending? Just get some good old lights so you can look and shine on your next call. Lorraine, what about you? Uh, I would say... If you are not using an external camera yet, I would recommend the Logitech I'm using. I used it pretty early on when I started. I'm still using it now, so it's worked well and you know help help me grow as a virtual speaker and and also just in meetings. So it works for both use cases. Can I ask which one it is? Because there's a couple of popular ones out there, like the C920 is really popular, the oh, yeah. Brio is really popular. Uh, it's the Brio, yeah. Okay, 
I was going to guess the Brio because I was like, you look very nice and crisp. Mm -hmm. So um, I think the C920 is um, a little is the Brio is sort of like the higher level one the between higher, yeah, yeah, between yeah. the two. Um, and so B, Z, A, key three, what does camo do and what's it for? Um, you know, not to be a shameless plug, but so camo allows you to get better video from any camera you can connect to your computer. I love that Alec brought up using the iPhone because Apple, Samsung, Google, they put so much R&D dollars into these cameras being incredible that we all have in the pockets of our hands. Camo started out as unlocking the power of that smartphone camera to be able to use it for video meetings and video calls. We have now horizontally integrated. Uh, yeah, that, that sounds right. Horizontally integrated to support all cameras. So Lorraine using her Brio, like you can or you're using your built-in camera, you have any other webcam, any computer, any camera you can connect to your computer, Camo can elevate it by offering this, you know, background blur that I have going on. We can fine tune your adjustments. You can adjust your colors to look exactly how you want. You can pan and crop in your video to crop out any distractions. If you have a bit of a busy background, we have a privacy blur. We have virtual background options also, but I would really say that if, you know, just for people that are starting out, yo, use that phone camera. Like we have, tons of customers and, and friends that are using camo with like an iPhone 8 or even an iPhone like 10, not even the latest ones. And you are still going to get way better, um, way better, way better results than like your built in built in webcam. Um, all right. I got a question from Prima Kadir, Ecamm fam. What's up? She asked, what app am I using to stream this show? Well, I am using Ecamm. This is actually my first time streaming live with Ecamm. Um, I finally decided to take take the leap and and level up my live streams using Ecamm. Um, yeah, let's uh, what about you guys? What do you guys you use when when y'all go live? Uh, Janae, you go first. Yep, I use Ecamm live as well. It's very powerful. And we've designed um, stream deck icons specifically for different functionality. So I have a podcast set I have a YouTube set, a webinar set, and you know all the different types of things that you can do. So that's completely integrated with Ecamm and Stream Deck. And we're actually using Ecamm Live on our GoBox Studio that you saw in the background earlier. Nice, nice. Lorraine, what about you? What do you use when you go live? Um, I usually use StreamYard or, I mean, I love the team at Ecamm, so I'll give them a shout out as well. Alec, what about you? Yep, I'm uh, Ecamm too. So uh, yeah, and th th another feature of Ecamm that I love is the ability to turn on the virtual camera. So you can just take all of the Ecamm production quality in directly into Zoom as well. So that's uh, mm -hmm. probably my biggest use case of it is actually for virtual meetings and things like that. Nice. Yeah, that's actually a great tip is I, I, I know, ever, I feel like a lot of people know that Ecamm is a streaming software, but the virtual camera, I think, is something that they added a little bit later. It has been out for a while now, but being able to use Ecamm in your Zoom calls is is totally clutch. And Lorraine, I actually love that you brought up StreamYard because I think StreamYard is one of the easiest streaming softwares to learn how to use. It's what I've used for all of my past um, live streams. They're an awesome team over there as well. Um, I just, I find that you can really get very customized with with ecamm and that's kind of what i was we were going for so all right we got time for one more question also from prima um how do we get the take one tech ai workbook alec <laughs> this right. one's for you take one tech yeah so take one tech.io is my website and then if you scroll down you'll find there's that workbook and there's a series of others uh, downloads there as well so they're just free re resources that you can download all for free what Nice. Um, and just on this note, yo, like Lorraine offers tons of tons of free resources on, on her site, her LinkedIn learning courses, her newsletter. It's all free and it is out there. She's also available for one to one coaching sessions. All of these will be in the video description. Like I said, our boy Janaid is doing AI workshops, AI talks. He is the home studio mastery guy. How you can get your video to look like him. He's your guy. Um, and 
yeah, I just also want to add uh, this uh, Ecamm Lives for the win from <laughs> Life Coaching for Men. And yo, shout out to my guy Imran, also Web Squadron. He uses OBS. Yo, OBS is is the OG is the OG, OG software. I, I'm not gonna lie, I, I gave OBS a try, and I, there was a lot of settings. I'm pretty sure all the I, ones I tried were wrong. So <laughs> I, I pulled out my last hair with OBS <laughs> before <laughs> discovering Ecamm. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, thank you everyone for joining. Thank you audience for your questions. We're gonna be doing Camo Classroom consistently at least once a month uh, to get started. Thank you to my awesome guests, Lorraine, Janaid, Alec. Yo, it's 2 a.m. for Alec. He's, he's in Thailand. I didn't even know that. But um, thank you all for joining me for this awesome conversation. And we will see you guys next time. All right, let me, how do I, how do I end this? <laughs> Hope they can't hear me right now. <laughs> I'm glad you said something. I thought we were all hanging up. <laughs> Still alive. Um, Just hit finish. Oh, yeah. And